I'm Jack Souza, Artistic Director at Prospect Theatre Project. Well, we here at PTP thought you'd appreciate hearing from designer, writer, producer, educator, and director Ken White about his new play being presented virtually as a stage reading at Prospect, Early Morning Light. Early Morning Light is a one-act play that centers around the climbing rivalry between Yosemite climbing mavericks Royal Robbins and Warren Hardy. It features Merced's Phoenix Collective's director and actors Joseph Hypes and Matt Capron as Robbins and Hardy, and me as Ken's recurring character, Dr. Tarr. Let's hear from Ken. Well, it's, it's kind of a test drive. Uh, gives you an opportunity to hear the words, an opportunity to see how the actors will interpret those words and interpret the characters they're playing, um, and gives us a chance to gauge the audience's reaction to some of the things you've written. To, in the case of if you're writing something dramatic, hopefully it, it works. If you're writing something comedic, hopefully they'll laugh. Um, but as a playwright, as a writer, sitting alone at the desk in front of the computer, uh, it's pretty isolating. And you can read it in your head and hear the words and assume that they're working, but you really don't know until you actually take it out and, like I say, give it a test drive. I had wanted to write a story about Royal for quite a while. I first met him in 1985. I was working in San Francisco uh, for another apparel company that's fairly well known, and that was Levi Strauss. And I read an article in a business journal about these three guys that were doing uh, uh, kayaking, whitewater kayaking. And it was Doug Tompkins, who owned Esprit and North Face, Yvonne Chouinard, who owned and owns Patagonia, and Royal Robbins, who had Royal Robbins clothing. And as I read it, I realized that Royal was based in Modesto. And I'm like, wow, I've got to meet this guy. He's in my hometown. He's in the apparel business. I'm doing apparel work. So I contacted him, wrote him a letter. And shortly thereafter that, we got together and, and uh, established an acquaintance that lasted up until he, he passed away. And we would get together from time to time and talk about some projects and talk about writing and talk about what he was doing. And I got a chance to meet Liz and the rest of the folks that, that worked um, at the shop there. And his business actually was located uh, near MJC in the location of the old Randick Paper Company, which was right next door to Byright Market. Well, I worked at Byright Market from the age of 12 until probably 16. So it was really coming back to, to where I have been for many years. And um, so I had always wanted to write a story about it. And it, and it just sort of marinated for years and years and years. And then I finally decided, okay, it's, it's time to get started. Then I started doing some research and I tend to do more research than is necessary. I mean, my background is in English and in, in history, so I'm, I love research. And uh, the deeper I got into the research, the one story that kept coming up was his rivalry uh, or competition, as we call it in the, in the stage play, with a gentleman named Warren Harding, and not the president, who, who will pop up if you Google Warren Harding. You have to Google Warren Harding, rock climber. Um, but they uh, they had a very dynamic competition, and they were very different people in terms of their view of the world, their view of climbing, their view of Yosemite, their view of the environment. And uh, so they had this ongoing one-upmanship in Yosemite over a period of time of climbing on all the, the big walls. And they, in fact, actually climbed together um, for a while and then went their separate ways and started climbing with other people. But there was one particular climb that uh, I continued to read about because it really contrasted their two views of the, the world of, of rock climbing. And it was over the, the climbing of the Don Wall. 
And the Don Wall is on um, El Cap, and it is uh, also called the Wall of Early Morning Light. And those two names for the wall were developed by Warren Hardy and a fellow climber named Glenn Denny, who took a lot of photographs of all the climbers. And in fact, we're, we're using some of his imagery in the, uh, in the stage play. And uh, so they're sitting around one day drinking Red Mountain as the sun's coming up. And Warren says, you know, we should give this a name. And he said, I like the wall of early morning light. And Denny said, ah, oh, that's too long. Let's just call it the Dawn Wall. And they went back and forth, back and forth until they were out of Red Mountain wine and that was it. So uh, when I was looking for the name, uh, I wanted something shorter than the Wall of Early Morning Light. And eventually I thought about the Dawn Wall, but it had been used in documentaries and some other programs already. So I thought Early Morning Light was a, a good title for it. And um, so the story is really about the competition and the uh, controversy over how Warren climbed it versus how Royal climbed it. So Warren, he only wanted to get up to the top and get over the summit. He didn't care how, he didn't care what people th thought. It was like, I'm going to do it my way and I don't care. Royal, on the other hand, wanted to do it the right way, the better way, and at some level did care about what people thought. So in October of uh, 1970, um, Warren decided to climb the Don Wall, and he took a guy along with him named uh, Dean Caldwell. It was just the two of them. And they were going to do it in a, a somewhat traditional style. They were going to take however long it took. They were going to do a pitch a day and, you know, take as long as they could to get up, uh, get up the mountain until they got to the summit. So it took them 27 days. So they would go up, climb a pitch, come down. A day or two later, go back up, climb and get a little more, come down. And they took up all kinds of stuff. They took up food, they took up wine, they, all kinds of stuff. And uh, actually, Harding's nickname was Batso because he loved hanging off a wall in a bivouac tent that made him look like a bat. And he, he just loved that stuff. So, so anyway, while they were climbing, the technique they used was he drilled a lot of holes and drilled 330 holes for various um, bits of equipment to get him up to the top. And while they were climbing, they had rainstorms, thunderstorms, all kinds of stuff going on. And at one point, the Park Service thought they were in trouble. So they called in the helicopters, called in them other Park Service people and, and wanted to rescue them, wanted to get them off the wall. And Harding and Caldwell are writing handwritten written notes, putting them in cans, empty cans of food, throwing them off the mountain and saying, no, we're doing fine. Don't rescue us. Leave us alone. So eventually the Park Service called off the dogs and, and let them go. And uh, so they eventually made it to the top. And when they crested the top, there was all kinds of publicity there. News photographers, uh, uh, CBS News was there, the Fresno uh, Bee was there, and so they were you know, all this publicity. And actually Harding and Caldwell were, ho were hoping that would happen. They thought maybe they could turn that into some profit of some sort, which eventually they were able to do. They were able to go do uh, some brand awareness for some manufacturers. Um, so anyway, Royal, even though he disagreed with the way they did it, praised Warren for having the guts to make it happen and to get it done. But he disagreed with the way it was done. And so he basically felt that he needed to make a statement about the way it was done for the rest of the climbing community and the rest of the world for that matter. And, and Royal was very um, strict in his viewpoint. In fact, he was, Warren referred to he and his, his cohorts as the, the Valley Christians, because they were very dogmatic about how it should be done. And Yosemite was the, was the cathedral. So uh, he recruited a gentleman named Don Loria. Didn't tell him what it was they were gonna do. He just said, we're gonna go climb the route, the same route that they just did, and we're gonna do it faster. And so 
John said, sure, whatever, sounds great. So they started climbing and Royal said, Don, why don't you take the first pitch? And Don did. So while he's taking the first pitch and going up, all of a sudden he hears this chopping, this uh, cold metal against metal. And he looks back and Royal is chopping the bolts out of the rock with a cold chisel and a hammer. And, and Laurie has gone, dude, I just used that. What, what are you doing? And, and Jack Royal's comment was that uh, chopping out the bolts was the, the name of the game, that he was going to erase the entire route and so that nobody could ever climb it that way again. And so Don went along with it and they said, fine. So he got, oh, I don't know, I think he chopped out about 40 bolts and finally stopped and realized that it was a much better climb than he thought it was. It was tough, it was brilliant, and he stopped. So they finished the climb, came down off the mountain, and at some point had a conversation with Warren, which we dramatize, about the fact that, um, that he was wrong. And, and that was kind of a tough thing for Royal to say, because he didn't really like to admit he was wrong, but especially about climbing. And so, for me, that was the metaphor about the two different views of climbing in Yosemite, because they really were the, the, the two main guys at that time. They were the, the main big wall climbers. Some of the others were coming along behind them, but they, like Gridwell and others, but they were the guys. And so, it was a great way to sort of contrast um, how they viewed climbing and, and that whole dramatic situation that took place. That, that, led to me focusing on that um, for the story. And, and basically, it's just that incident. It's, so it's a one-act play, it's not a three-act play. It runs about an hour as opposed to an hour and a half or two hours. And people suggest, well, why don't you write a little bit about the beginning and a little bit about after and sort of their lives before and after. And I said, well, you know, I think I can cover that in the context of this story, their philosophy of you know, the world, their philosophy of climbing, their competition, who they were as, as people. And uh, so I really didn't want to explore the, the previous and the post. Well, all of the material except for some of the screenplays that I've written um, are all about Modesto and Central Valley. I made that decision early on that I wanted to contribute to a regional voice. And I was inspired, um, when I first moved back to Modesto, I was working on a novel called Tyranny of the Downbeat. And it was about the politics of water in California. And uh, it's, it's a pretty powerful piece and, and a pretty powerful subject. And when I came back into town, I, I connected with Lillian Valley, who was teaching at MJC. And of course, she's written poetry about the Central Valley and uh, so on. And I asked her to read it, which she was very kind to do because it was it was not a short piece. And um, so from that point on, I was determined to make everything I wrote in some form about Modesto. And uh, and Tyranny of the Downbeat hasn't been published yet. I, I actually, thanks to the pandemic, I revisited it, went back to it, and it, it held up. So I'm hoping that, that that will be something that will come out uh, in the coming year. But um, so I've written stage plays, uh, the novels and novelettes, uh, two children's books that are Christmas books that are all about Modesto. One is called The uh, the Twelve Days of Central Valley Christmas. So basically, I take things that are based in the Central Valley and, and put it to the, the well-known Christmas song. So instead of five golden rings, it's five golden peaches, clings. That is funny. Yeah. So, uh, and I had Ron Wilkinson, who's a local designer in Turlock, he did the illustrations for the first one, um, as well as the illustrations for the second one, and did a great job. The first one is actually called The Happiness Thing, and it's about a 10-year-old boy who wants to find out why his family isn't happy at Christmas time, should be really happy. And so he goes around downtown Modesto and talks to different people and things and animate and inanimate objects and asks them what makes them happy. And we did a, an interesting technique where we took illustrations and superimposed them over historical photos. So we've got an image of this young boy talking to a, 
old homeless man in front of the McHenry Mansion or in front of uh, Harley's Music or in front of the State Theater. So anyway, he ends his journey. He goes back home. He encounters the old homeless guy who actually turns out to be St. Nick, who tells him that happiness is home and family. And so uh, that ends his journey. Um, but again, they're all about Modesto. Uh, and then I wrote a nonfiction book uh, for the McHenry Museum called Touchstones, uh, which Jack contributed to. Um, and that was a snapshot of Modesto uh, a couple of years ago. And, and then, of course, the stage plays. So I did uh, My Father's House, My Good Mother, Early Morning Light. Um, and then I'm working on a play right now with Arnold Schmidt, who uh, teaches at Stan State, on the Maddox Brothers and Rose. And it's going to be a jukebox musical, like uh, the Million Dollar Quartet, um, where we'll dramatize their lives, particularly Rose's, and then we'll have them or other musicians uh, sing their songs. And um, that's another Modesto story I always wanted to write. And when I finally got into it, I did not realize what an impact they had on country music. In fact, if you watched Ken Burns' country music special documentary, they're mentioned in the first five minutes and then mentioned again throughout. And they had a huge influence on female singers and on male singers, but also their role in establishing rock and roll. I mean, they really started rockabilly, which led eventually to, to rock and roll. So their role in, in the genesis of rock and roll is, is pretty amazing. So it's been fun working on that and we're very close to having that done and ready to do a, a table read of that to kind of see how it all works. Um, but uh, I've been doing that as well. And, uh, but yeah, for me, it's always been about, about the Central Valley. And, and one of the reasons I I did that, and, and one of the reasons I wrote, wrote Touchstones, I also did several essays for Modesto View Magazine. Here's my plug for Modesto View. But I don't know if you remember or not, but a couple of years ago, CNN did a story on Modesto, and there was a whole series of uh, rankings that started coming out about worst places to live, worst education, so on and so on and so on. And Modesto was always at the bottom of the list. And I was like, you know, these people are writing these stories based on statistics they're getting from a third party, and none of them have ever been in this town. And I just felt it was time to sort of correct the story a little bit and show that not only to those people, but to people who live in Modesto, who apologize all the time for this town, that there's a lot to admire and appreciate in our town. And, and that's what I tried really to do with the Touchstones book. Um, and I think we did a pretty good job of, of the span and the, and the breadth of things that, that are going on in, in our city. It took over two years, and I had over 200 contributors and that was writers, photographers, and artists. And uh, I did it for the McHenry uh, Museum and Historical Society. And they wanted me to write uh, history because we were coming up on the sesquicentennial of the founding of Vanessa. And I said, no, we've written a history. Let's, why don't we do a contemporary snapshot of this town now? And I said that I can't write that. I can write part of it, but I can't write the whole thing. But I said, there's lots of people in town who couldn't write that. So I went out to different individuals who, who had an expertise in certain subjects, and I asked them to write an essay. So I went to Jim Johnson to ask about writing about the arts, and Chris Murphy to ask about uh, writing about graffiti, uh, Bob Barzan about uh, architecture. And so we compiled all that, and I worked as an editor to put that together. And then I got uh, Carl Bagazi involved to do uh, editorial on it and help out. Janet Lancaster helped out to make sure all the history was correct, everything was where it should be. And I had another ex modestin a gentleman named John Matos, uh, did the cover. And it was just a, a beautiful job. Um, and, uh, and we put it out, and it was very well received. And in fact, there are still copies available at the McHenry Museum. You can go onto their website and, uh, and purchase copies of it. So I was very proud of that, but uh, it was not a uh, small undertaking.